familiar faces return as Scott tries to assemble his army on this week's episode of Teen Wolf titled Werewolves of London. Let's break it down on what happened. How's it going you lovely people? Lisa here, back with another Teen Wolf recap. Scott is finally ready to fight back and tries to assemble his army while Gabe actually tries to help Theo and Liam and Lydia discovers something big as well. Let's get this recap started. So the first two faces to pop up in this episode you've known about since Teen Wolf has been promoting it a lot now. Jackson and Ethan are back and it's some of my favorite scenes from this episode. I actually kind of wish MTV hadn't released both of their main clips of the episode ahead of time so it'd be more of a surprise to people but the episode does contain longer cuts of those scenes that end up bookending this episode nicely. Jackson and Ethan now live in London and are a couple and it's the night of their anniversary and Ethan has planned this perfect date but Jackson's nowhere to be found. Turns out he's actually been captured by hunters who come busting through the door and shoot Ethan with some wolfsbane. When the hunters think they've won, Ethan tells them they should have used the yellow wolfsbane on Jackson since he's not only part werewolf, he's part canima. And now both of those parts of Jackson are mad and he ends up knocking out the hunters. It looks like Ethan and Jackson have been trying to track down Omegas, but the hunters found them first and they've been killing them and taking trophies. Ethan and Jackson now question those hunters trying to figure out who sent them and it turns out that it's Gerard and they know they have to go back to Beacon Hills. So the two show up at the school at the end of the episode and bump into Monroe who asks if she can help them. They say they're looking for Scott who's the assistant lacrosse coach and of course Monroe is like, oh, what's your name? And she puts two and two together and realizes these are two of the werewolves she's been looking for. So what does she do? She captures them and puts them through her nice shock torture, asking them what they want with Scott. And of course, they refuse to tell her. Moving on to cliffhanger from last episode, who was shot and whose bloody hand was in the air? Well, it turns out multiple people were wounded, basically everyone in that house who wasn't supernatural. Scott's dad was injured and transferred to San Francisco Memorial. Mason is out of surgery doing fine and Lydia is okay too as the bullet that missed her missed everything that mattered. And while well, Scott is sitting in the waiting room waiting the fate of his mom, Melissa, who seems to have had the worst injury. The doctors are operating on her and he's listening in from afar. They do get the bullet out and it turns out she's going to be just fine. We also get a sweet Scalia moment as Malia waits with Scott and holds his hand as he awaits the fate of his mom. When Scott goes to see Melissa before she passes out from her sedative, she gives Scott some advice. Stop running and fight back. Scott is now ready to fight back and tells Malia the days of the peace summits and running are over and they are going to take these hunters on, but to do so, they're going to need an army. Now before I get on the Scott's army, let's move on to Sheriff Stalinsky. Now he's trying to break Monroe and get her to confess to the shooting at the McCall house, or at least find out who did it. He calls her to his office and lays out all the bullets. And it turns out he knows that Monroe is innocent as she has an alibi thanks to the security footage at the school. He's basically using this time to try to show her that Gerard isn't to be trusted and he's done so many despicable things like killing a 16 year old thinking it'd give him control over a canima, he killed his own men to try to frame Deucalion to start a war, oh and the beast attack that started all of this with Monroe, it actually could have been prevented if Gerard hadn't withheld important information so he could try and kill the beast alone to restore his name. For a split second it seems like Sheriff Stalinsky could be getting through to her, but it's evil Monroe, of course. She's not gonna fall for it. She turns on Stalinsky and in fact, she has taken over basically his whole sheriff station and turned all the cops and deputies against him. She thinks Stalinsky is basically an ineffective sheriff and he'd rather lie to protect the supernaturals over protecting the humans, even though he really is protecting the humans too. Monroe tells Stalinsky that she knows that she can't trust Gerard, but she knows he's going to win and that's all she cares about. Now before leaving the station, and thankfully Stalinsky didn't give up his gun and badge, he tells Monroe he never told her that Gerard wouldn't beat him. He said Gerard wouldn't beat Scott. I gotta say I love Stalinsky's faith in Scott, but now with all the cops except for Parrish turn on him, Stalinsky's really gonna have to watch his back. While Scott and Malia are out trying to build their army, Liam is trying to figure out who shot up the McCall house, so he goes straight to Gabe for answers. Liam's getting his anger out on Gabe in the locker room, and Gabe says he doesn't know anything and he has no idea who shot up the house. Liam is just getting angrier and angrier, smashes Gabe's head into the mirror, cracking the glass, making Gabe start to bleed, and he's basically yelling at Gabe, saying, you know, you think we're all killers? You think I'm gonna kill you? And then Theo pops up behind Liam asking if he's actually going to kill Gabe and that he doesn't really care if he does, but if Liam goes through with it, it's just gonna cause a bigger mess. And then they're gonna have to go kill all the witnesses that saw him bring Gabe in and buy body bags and shovels and all of this. And yeah, it's basically just Theo's way of telling Liam, 
to not kill Gabe. Well, it does talk Liam down and he eventually lets Gabe go. Theo tells Liam he's making progress since he didn't kill Gabe and Liam is like trying to figure out why Theo keeps saving him because it's never gonna make Scott forget what Theo has done and make him part of the pack. As they continue to bicker, Gabe chimes in saying that they should try harder to keep people alive. Liam is then like, what do you mean? Gabe then goes quiet, making it Theo's turn to smash his head into the mirror until Gabe starts to talk and Gabe mentions bodies. What bodies? Well, Gabe takes them to a freezer at the school with bodies inside that look very similar to the other bodies we've seen the Anukate try to inhabit with the spiders, where the gross eye sockets are all black and missing and the mouths are whatever. You know the grossness. Gabe says they were hiding the bodies so people wouldn't find out they were testing to see if people were werewolves, but they weren't the ones that actually killed these people. It was something else. Now, Theo and Liam realized that it had to be the Anukate who must be looking for its other half, and then Gabe mentions it was Aaron's idea to test everyone, and now our heroes know Aaron must be one half of the Anukate. Later in the locker room, Nolan and Gabe are now in there talking, and Gabe reveals to Nolan he's the one who actually shot up the McCall house, but he did it because he's trying to keep Nolan alive. He ended up telling Monroe that it was actually Nolan who shot up the house, and it seems like Nolan's pretty caught off guard. Next up, Lydia, who has survived the shooting, is in her hospital bed, and she wakes up and is all of a sudden freezing. When she walks out of her room, the hospital is empty and everything is icy. We realize it's one of her premonitions, and she ends up following a path leading to the morgue. When she goes inside, she sees one of the drawers burning and she opens it. And then from here, her storyline ends up connecting with Scott and Malia, so I'm going to go over to those two. Now, Scott's building his army, and first up on his recruiting list is... Deucalion. He meets them at the house, but unfortunately for Scott, Deucalion's fighting days are over. In fact, instead of fighting, he's changed up his lifestyle and taken up Bugua martial arts, which takes the path of least resistance. In other words, he's really quick on his feet and can basically end up beating his opponent without actually landing a punch or throwing a punch. Deucalion then tells Scott that Gerard won't be the last to capitalize on the public's fear, and while he's not afraid to lose his eyes again in war, he is afraid to lose his soul, so he's not going to fight with them, but he is happy to offer some guidance. Tell Scott and Malia to basically lower their standards for allies. When Scott says that he thought he did, Deucalion's like, nope, you gotta go lower than me. So who is lower than Deucalion? None other than Peter Hale. Peter makes Scott and Malia meet him at Eichen House, and I love the quips between Peter and Malia. Like, I'd actually love to watch a spinoff with just the two of them. Actually, can we get a spinoff of them and then one of Theo, Liam, and Mason? Peter tells Scott he's perfectly happy with his new life, his penthouse, his two really fancy cars, and he's just all about self-preservation. He also tells Scott that they won't defeat Gerard, and he brought them to Eichenhaus to show them why. He's actually captured a hunter who was after him and locked him up in a cell. They point out that the guy is armed with a G36, a gun that can fire 750 rounds per minute minute. Yeah, whoever is in the aim of that fire doesn't really stand a chance. Peter wants to show them this, so he gives the guy back his clip and the hunter has no problem just firing all his bullets at Scott, which are thankfully stopped by the glass. But once he's out of bullets, the hunter busts through the glass and attacks Scott. Now Scott is able to uh, knock the guy out, but Peter's like, see that? That's someone who can't be reasoned with. They hate us so much and they are following blind obedience. Like, they're not gonna stop for anything. Peter then tells Scott that no one is going to make it through a war with clean hands and if Scott won't start killing, he's gonna have to find someone who will. Well then later he goes and sits with Malia outside the school and asks what she really wants. Malia tells Peter there's something else going on here so she lets him inside her head where he sees just what the Nukate can do and yep, Peter is shook. Peter then says, is this why you wanted to meet me? You wanted to surround Scott with killers so he could keep his hands clean. And Peter's so spooked that he's like, you know what, forget this, I'm going back to, you know, my fancy car. And it turns out one of those fancy cars was actually for Malia, but she doesn't take the gift. Instead, she goes to Scott and tells him that they have to come up with another plan, because Peter's not budging. So what's their plan? To go after a pack of werewolves called the Primal that are basically killers, and they're so desperate that that's what they have to do. Outside of the Primal's lair, Malia and Scott start to feel the effects of the Nuka tape, but they grab each other's hands and head into the warehouse where it seems like it's empty until they get to a back room to see the entire pack dead, killed in the same way as those bodies in the freezer by the Nukate. They then turn around to see Lydia in the doorway in her hospital gown saying that Halwyn led her there and he wanted her to find it. What is it? Well, the trio head into the woods and it seems like the connection with a banshee and a hellhound, even a dead hellhound, is stronger than they all thought. Lydia is on the hunt for a body, which they finally find, and it's another one of those faceless 
corpses. Theo and Liam then show Scott and Malia the bodies Gabe showed them in the freezer and they realize they need to find the other half of the Nukate fast and they now know that the other half they're looking for is a werewolf. Peter then shows up and it seems like the hunters blew up not one but both of his precious cars and now he's pissed and he is on board ready to help them. In the parking lot, Peter is in Malia's car and she asks Peter why he really did come back. Peter gives the bullshit excuse that his cars were being blown up to hide that of course he has any kind of feelings whatsoever, but Malia knows his shenanigans. She says it was something in my head that convinced you, right? And we then see Peter look at Scott across the parking lot and we get flashbacks to a bunch of Scalia moments as Peter saw Malia fall in love with Scott. And he tells her that Scott is going to get himself killed so don't fall in love with a dead man. But Malia says, it's too late. Okay, so Peter basically came back to protect the love of his daughter's life. Like, how sweet is that, Peter? You really do got a soft spot deep down in there, especially for your daughter. Okay, I'm gonna say not maybe my favorite episode of the season as a whole. I felt like we were starting to pick up steam and this one just kind of seemed a little slow again, but I did love all the familiar faces returning. And of course, plenty of funny moments with the banter. I love Jackson and Ethan together and I really missed both of those characters. I love all the Theo and Liam moments. Like they're honestly way better than Nolan and Gabe because like what are their purposes again? And of course, Peter and Malia together, they are gold. If I can't have Styles humor, I will take their humor all day long. It also looks like the Nukate has found its other half, the werewolf half, because of the faceless corpse in the woods they found. But whose body is in it and will the gang be able to stop it from merging with Aaron? Now whoever this person is, it's a member of the primal pack because the faceless body still had the marking of the pack symbol on its forearm. So I'm guessing this kind of debunks the theory that Nolan is the other half of the Nukate. I don't think he's had the you know, a pack symbol on him anywhere. So is this person going to be a new face we've never seen? Who is it going to be? I feel like it'd be fun though if it was a familiar face. Still, doesn't mean that Nolan isn't some kind of supernatural being because I know many people have mentioned that maybe he is a banshee or something, he just doesn't know it yet. He's also just getting so much screen time, so what is his purpose? Maybe he's like the key to stopping the Anukate in the end? Next week is actually a double dose of Teen Wolf on Sunday, so mark your calendars that you gotta carve out two hours for Teen Wolf. And then the next week after that is the extended finale, so only three episodes left, guys. So let's check out the promo for those next two episodes. Next on Teen Wolf. I'm way more terrified of turning my back on you. Someone at school. I think I know who it is. Just get close, find out, and get out. Our last shot at figuring out how to beat Nukate might be lying on that table. All right, so what did you think of this episode? Will Jackson and Ethan escape Monroe and help Scott and the pack win the fight? Will Lydia figure out who the other face of the Nukate is? Will Stolinski take down Monroe? Because I really hope so, because he's the captain. Monroe, you suck. Also, what's Nolan's purpose? Let me know down in the comments below all your theories, as well as your favorite and least favorite moments from this episode. After that, you can check out more of my videos right over here, and be sure to hit that thumbs up if you like what you see, and come back next week for another Teen Wolf recap. I'm Lisa, thanks so much for watching.